Welcome back to Under the Sea with Ellie. In the last video, we learned so many great facts about one of my favorite creatures, sharks. We're going to do a quick reminder about some of the things that we learned about last time before talking about underwater friendships. We learned so many things about a shark's body. Can you remember how many bones a shark has? Did you remember? The answer is none. A shark doesn't have any bones and its skeleton is made from cartilage. Do you remember what is made out of cartilage on your body? It's your nose and your ears. See how they're a little bendy? A shark's skin is made up of thousands of little teeth-like plates called denticles. Not to be confused with tentacles, these are called denticles with a D. Did you know that some sharks give birth to live young, just like we do? Other sharks can lay eggs, like chickens. Do you remember what shark egg cases are sometimes called? That's right, they're called mermaid's purses. We also spoke to my friend Kat last time and she told us loads of cool facts about how sharks reproduce. We then spoke about a few different types of sharks. Whaler sharks are the largest group of sharks. There are 56 shark species in this group. That's a lot of sharks. Some of the whaler sharks we talked about were grey reef sharks, bull sharks and tiger sharks. We then spoke about hammerhead sharks, which have a really unique wide head that they use to slice through water. Bottom dwelling sharks use buccal pumping to pump water across their gills so they can lay about on the sea floor. Sounds pretty good to me. Whale sharks are the biggest fish in the ocean and are filter feeders. Very little is known about these mysterious giants. Finally, we talked about some sharks in British waters. Some of them are blue sharks, mako sharks and basking sharks. You might think that you can't help sharks by being at home, but you definitely can. Buying sustainably caught fish, which is caught by line and pole, is a great way of reducing bycatch and saving our shark populations. Over the last few videos, we have been working our way up the ocean ecosystem. So today we're going to be talking about something that affects lots of different creatures in the ecosystem and works in different ways depending on what creatures are involved. We're going to be talking about underwater friendships and relationships. These are often called symbiotic relationships. Can you say that word with me? Symbiotic. Symbiotic. Well done. I'd love for you to practice saying that word for next time we get together. Symbiosis means the relationship between two creatures. There are actually five types of symbiosis in the ocean. Some of them are positive and others not so much. We're going to talk through a few of these and give you some cool examples along the way. Are you ready? Let's go. The first form of symbiosis we're going to be talking about today is one you might already recognise, mutual symbiosis. Mutual symbiosis is described as the relationship between creatures or organisms of different species where both organisms benefit from the friendship. We've actually talked about symbiosis before in our very first lesson. Coral reefs are a great example of mutual symbiosis. Coral polyps are home to algae. The coral gets fed by the algae and the algae has a safe home to live in. If you want to learn more about coral reefs, go back and watch episode one of Under the Sea with Ellie. You'll probably recognise this example of mutual symbiosis from the film Finding Nemo. The relationship that Nemo and his dad Marlin have with the anemone that they live within. Sea anemones have these beautiful tentacles that actually release toxins which paralyse fish when they touch them. Clownfish, however, like Nemo and his dad, have a special substance like mucus on their bodies, which means they don't get affected by the toxin. Do you know what mucus is? It's a slimy substance, a bit like the snot that comes from your nose when you have a cold. Gross. Ugh. Anemones have mouths in the middle of their tentacles. The clownfish attract fish into the anemone because they're trying to eat the clownfish. They get too close, they're stung by the toxins on the tentacles and then eaten up. By living in the anemone, the clownfish is protected from other predators that can't get close to eat them. It gives them a safe space to spend their lives. 
they even use the underside of the anemone to lay their eggs. You can see that in this picture here. This little orangutan crab also lives in an anemone, but you can see that this anemone looks quite different. This is in a bubble coral, which instead of tentacles, it's made up of grape-sized bubbles. The crab can hide away in the coral and barely be seen by predators and will keep the bubble coral clean from any particles that might get stuck on the coral. Another form of mutual symbiosis can be seen at cleaning stations. There are so many examples of cleaning as a form of mutual friendship, so we're going to talk through a few different examples. In this picture, you can see this moray eel, which is the big green creature, being cleaned by a little shrimp. The shrimp will have lots of different fish, including this eel, come to the hole that he lives in to be cleaned. The shrimp eats all the little parasites on their skin and gets a tasty meal. The fish gets nice and clean so they don't feel uncomfortable. Think about a dog with fleas, or maybe you've had head lice, also known as nits. Doesn't feel very nice, does it? Shrimp will even climb into the mouth of certain fish to clean inside there and don't have to worry about getting eaten, which is very cool. A bit like a trip to the dentists. Turtles, sharks and manta rays all use cleaning stations. These are areas of the coral reef where lots and lots of cleaner fish live. Do you remember we spoke about butterfly fish in episode 2? You can go back to watch it and remind yourself of these brilliant little cleaner fish. Bigger creatures line up and take it in turns to be cleaned by these butterfly fish. The butterfly fish remove the uncomfortable parasites living on their skin and get a tasty meal, just like the shrimp. Commensalism happens when one creature lives with or on another creature of a different species. The creature doing the carrying is known as the host. The host doesn't get anything from the friendship, but it isn't hurt by the friendship either. A great example of commensalism is a barnacle sitting on a whale. Look at this picture. You can see a big humpback whale nose with lots of barnacles stuck to its skin. The barnacles don't hurt the humpback whales. They benefit from the friendship because they get a free ride to parts of the ocean that are filled with delicious plankton and krill, which the whales feed on. Here is another example of commensalism symbiosis. Remember, one of the friends gets something out of it and the other, the host, doesn't. Looking at this picture, it's pretty clear who is doing all the hard work. Nudibranch are sea slugs that come in hundreds of different shapes and sizes and colours. We'll be talking more about them in one of our future videos. Parasites are little creatures that live on or in a host and use it to feed and feel safe. With commensalism symbiosis that we just talked about, one creature benefits and the other isn't affected at all. With parasitic symbiosis, the parasite benefits from food and safety, maybe even travel, but the host does not benefit. Take a look at this picture here. Can you see the little fish with a parasite attached to its body? The parasite will have its teeth in the fish and will suck blood from it, which makes the host fish tired. Think about a mosquito that never leaves you. Not very nice, is it? Can you spot the parasite in this clownfish? Look very carefully. That's right, there he is with his little eyes looking out at us. This parasite has actually replaced the clownfish's tongue. How strange is that? The parasite will climb into the fish through the gills on the side of their body and attach themselves to the fish's tongue and will eventually replace the tongue. They'll eat some of the blood from the host fish as well as some of the food that the host fish eats. Fish with more than one parasite in their mouth can be quite skinny because they're not able to eat as much as they need. Mimicry symbiosis is really cool so I've saved it till last. Do you like to play fancy dress and dress up like a pirate or an astronaut? Maybe even a dragon? Or maybe you want to camouflage yourself like they do in the army by covering your face in paint so that you can't be seen hiding in the bushes. You are pretending to be something or to be someone else. Another word for pretending is mimicking. A mimic octopus can look like up to 15 other animals to protect themselves from predators. That is a lot of fancy dress. This mimic octopus is trying to look like a mantis shrimp. Can you see the similarities? 
octopus can change their colour and even the texture of their skin in a matter of milliseconds. That's quicker than you can say the word octopus. We're going to be talking about them more in our next video, Masters of Disguise. Don't forget to follow Luna Dive School on Facebook and on YouTube to find out when our next video is going live. In Masters of Disguise, we'll learn about amazing creatures that camouflage into their surroundings to protect themselves. If under the sea videos like this one have helped you to fall in love with the ocean, here are two really simple things to help you save the environment, which are in turn good for the ocean. Try to cut down on the amount of plastic that you use, things like plastic bottles or straws. And remember, turn off your TV or your lights when you're not using them around the house. By reducing the amount of electricity you use, you can help the ocean too. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe Lunar Dive School and share this video with your friends so that they can learn some cool facts about our oceans.